Okay, uh, we're going to talk about CNN today, so it will be a whirlwind tour of CNN, so we will go pretty quickly. Uh, so I, I just want to spend one, one class today like on CNN, and uh, next week we'll talk about camera models. We will go back to something classical. So, um, it, it's not classical, but, but not deep learning. So, CNN. So as you play with the homework, you realize that if I just use fully connected layer, uh, it doesn't work that well for at least for computer vision applications. Like if you just want to recognize characters, you pad that as a just I mean make that image like we uh, we shape that into a vector and trying to pass it through some uh, several little uh, fully connected layer. Um, try to train the model, it probably won't give you a very good result. So, um, CNN is a very simple idea, basically. Um, okay, the name, as the name suggests, a convolutional, right? Uh, it's at, actually, it's just like, uh, as we already learned in class that we have convolution, like doing convolution is just a filter for images. So you can, you can imagine that it makes sense if you have, uh, let's, let's, uh, step back like think of like what we are doing in a fully connected layer let's say if i have an image like an entire image like someone here um i'm going to vectorize that the whole thing let like maybe say 100 by 100 uh, image then this become like uh, a 10,000 a vector of length 10,000 then when i go for fully connected layer essentially i'm basically um weight sum each of the elements in the original image right so but you, you think of that like uh for example when we do filtering for an image it makes sense that like if i just consider like um patch like like a pixel at this position here probably a pixel very far away here doesn't really affect this one here so we, we have this localization um kind of like feature in the original image that we did. Yes. I can't see anything you're doing. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, uh, thank you for reminding me. Um, yes, I don't think I share screen yet. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for reminding me that. Uh, uh, so you, you can see it now? Uh, wait. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure. So what I'm saying, like, so say I have an image here. So if I, I just like kind of process like a pixel layer here, like, and it doesn't make, it's not, it doesn't make sense, but most likely like this pixel, like the, the characteristics or like the statistic here will not be affected by a pixel far away. So that's why we will have filter in classic, um, conventional uh, image processing we will have like finite length filter a finite size filter so here is the same thing we will just consider a filter here like um, instead of like have a fully connected layer that essentially will just mod weight sum like all the pixels like in the image will just like weight sum only for pixel nearby so this makes sense right so this is a convolutional um, layer that uh, a conf you can think of like a new one in the convolutional layer basically it's just a weight sum of like pixel nearby of a target pixel and uh, and what's more is like unlike conventional uh, kind of image processing uh, our filter here is is trainable so in what we study in class earlier we always have like let's say a gaussian filter like have always a, a shape like i don't know maybe this is a filter like this is the maximum in the mid um if i have a low pass filter like i have maximum in the center and then i like, continue to decay like as i go outside outward um here like basically i will have like filter all kind of filters will be trainable that's that's the main point here uh for cnn and also the other thing is like um, for a pixel here, um, I expect that like uh, what I'm seeing here, uh, if I move the object like shift to here, uh, uh, my filter like here and my filter here should kind of behave the same way. Right? So therefore, like also we want to have this share weight feature. Basically, like we're going to use the filters like 
same filter over the entire image. So it, it can't make sense. So it's like in terms of the network structure, there will be a weight sharing. So we train a filter, basically like we are training a same filter for the entire image. So that that's the <laughs> everything about CNN, basically. So now now we go, get to some of this detail here. So just give an example. Let's say I have like this is a like, uh, thirty-two by thirty-two by three images, uh, image. So basically like uh. With I'm having 32 by 32, and let's say I have three colors, like three channel here, and then like my filter size, let's say it's five by five. So I I unlike like um, classic filter like or like filter and conventional filter, we we uh, typically we have a depth here, say for for the filter. So our our filter is really volumetric instead of like a two dimensional. So uh. I, I instead of like just doing like layer by layer like white channel or like blue channel and green channel we'll just have uh, this whole thing basically I will just cut part of the volume here let's like say this is 5 by 5 by 3 I'll just do a dot border between these two guys right and then that will be the filter result so uh, 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 like that and this filter will move around the entire image so then you will get a uh, if if I consider that like uh, if I'm not going to pad the boundary, then I will sh essentially like after the filter here, I will shrink the size, uh, uh, the width and height by two. By because I do the filter is five by five ways, right? so it will be reduced by two like on each of the boundaries. So therefore, like the size will reduce to twenty eight by twenty eight, and then. So this is only just one layer of filter. And we can have many filters, right? This is like one filter, we can have like many, many filters and uh, like that. So for example, I have six filters, I can stack them together. Then next time I have a layer like that, now I can repeat to do like another convolutional layer. So I have like this, uh, uh, let's say I have like 10 filters of them. And again, I filter size five by five. And then I, I will shrink the size by uh, to twenty four by twenty four. And of course, I for this this like um, uh, operation here, just consider the convolution here is a linear operation. So unless I add some impose some like uh, nonlinear uh, operation in the middle, actually it, multiple layer doesn't do anything. Like I can just combine two layers into just one layer. So therefore, typically. After each convolutional layer, we have also an activation function, um, like conventional uh, neural network. And uh, for example, I, I will have Valut, let's say in this case, uh, that, that if you remember Valut is something like that, the verified uh, linear unit. So I, I will just have uh, something like that. Do you guys have any questions? Just just pause me, like if you have any questions. So, but basically CNN is very simple. <laughs> this, this um, uh, afterward, I will just talk about more history, application, and so on. But this is the core idea. So I, I want to make sure you guys understand the core idea. It's actually very simple. So don't don't be scared away. Like people talk about CNN, it looks like okay, it's like only like um, f uh, popular to, for the last decade. You you think it's like something very advanced, like uh, very com complicated. But actually, it's very simple, extremely simple. Um, history wise, like it was um. Kind of, uh, I believe I first, um, although like in the eighties, I uh, there's um, there's uh, a Japanese uh, scientist like Fukuom, uh, I forgot his name, Fuku, Fuku, Fukushima or something like. That. I think it's Fukushima. I, I forgot. Um, he proposed something like this already, but he didn't aware of like uh bad propagation. Like he he had this work like in early eighties, uh, so therefore like um. He didn't like have a basically a way to train that, so, and uh, an actual application I like, was uh, picked up by uh, um, Yang Lacun. Like, uh, this is one of the big three guys, uh, Lacun, and uh, he is now with like Facebook AI. He's the head of Facebook AI. Uh, I yeah, and um, <clears throat> and he when he was in like Bell Bell Lab, he basically have this. Uh, CNN trying to recognize a like, um, uh, was uh, recognize digit have it digit exactly like the homework, and this is using CNN, um, and uh, so 
Uh, and uh, w w one thing interesting to mention that uh, if I have multiple layers of CNN, if you you dig into like each layer's features, you can kind of like uh, visualize these features. Like, um, like you can think of like this is like different level of features. For example, like in lowest layer, you can see like features like edges and pad, something like that. And when you get to high and high level, you can see something interesting. For example, like. You can see like an eye and face or something like that. Um, and uh, I, I, I think I should go. Uh, doc, yes. Doctor Chen, yes. Could you go back just to that slide you were just on? Yes. I just have a question about this. Uh, it says it's trained on ImageNet. I've seen that come up a few times. I'm just wondering. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I. Uh, I'm not sure this trained on ImageNet or Cipher Ten. Uh, Cipher Ten. I guess it's a. Um, yeah, in, uh, yeah, probably this one is, uh, oh, but this is from Lacoon's slide. I'm not quite sure that like, it's a like, train on image lab. Well, but, that says below the images there. I just wonder what, uh, what is ImageNet? <coughs> oh, I image lab is just a, uh, a competition, uh, that, uh, is like organized by Stanford, like, like back in the days and they, they, uh, create, um, this, um, a data set and also alongside like a competition each year like do some recognition stuff so now the, the live the, the data set is still around uh, and the competition they keep evolving but um it's very common people use this image lab like as a benchmark like for training the data great uh, thank you yeah and um and this i guess i can i can really skip some of these slides because i have many slides here so um Oh, here, here is. I just want to say, uh, there's some terminology here. Apparently, yeah, you can like do filter for each of the pixel. In this case, we say like this. Uh, this, how do you call it? Stride. I get like stride is one. So I can do like skip every other pixel. In case we call it stride two. So it's like just some terminology. I want to mention that. So you can do stride fee and so on. And of course, like, if you have like stride this higher, then you you will uh, kind of like have this output resolution, uh, like output resolution may be smaller. And uh, in that way, you can also like use this stride to control the uh, resolution your, uh, of your output. And also like another very uh, common layer in a uh, convolutional neural network is so-called so this polling layer. This is also used for downsampling. sampling. The idea is very simple, like it's just um, you have like one layer here, like let's say the input is like this. So when we do a mass pulling with this so-called like two by two filters, then it's just like taking each two by two block and then like, we, we will just take uh, the maximum for that. If, if it's a maximum pulling, for example, in this case, uh, for each of these two by two block, like I, I just like, take the maximum, I got six here, this card, I got eight here and so on. And uh, so this is all. And um, of course, you can like compare the dimension and so on. Like, you can figure that out. It's very simple. So I won't uh, waste time on this uh, here now. So and um, and this is like a, a very classic uh, kind of a CNN structure. Basically, uh, you have this like conf layer and then where loop conf layer where loop. And after a while, you do a polling down sample a little bit and then conf. Value, con value, con value, like polling and so on. Uh, this is like used in the original like uh, Young Lacoon's uh, uh, model, like they the, the call it Lacoon 5 or something, I forgot the name for that. And also like used in the uh, kind of like Alex Lad also, like this is like the Alex Lad in uh, uh, t uh, 2012. And this um, basically win the image Lad competition that, uh, that Bandon uh, mentioned that one image light competition in 2012 is uh, it looks fancy in this one just because like uh, at that time they used GPU to uh, train the model and GPU is like have like smaller memory size at that time and then they need to speed the model somehow but basically they just have something like that it's still like have a conflict and a polling layer conflict polling layer and so on they have this normalization layer that uh, people do not use uh, as frequent anymore, uh, they they have the okay, but people use like some kind of something called batch normalization, but they use a different normalization in their paper, uh, and batch normalization is just like 
you you at a, uh, when you get into the batch normalization layer, you try to normalize the input uh, statistics to a uh, seal mean and univariant. That that's it. That's the batch normalization do. But you you can the um. And of course, you you are not sure for the next layer whether this uh, unit mean and um, sorry still mean and unit variance will be like the best uh, statistic for the next layer. So typically, what the batch normalization layer include is like uh, you first like, normalize that like for the batch to still mean and uh, unit variance, and at the same time like you just shift it back with some mean and variance. And this uh, when you shift it. Uh, this mean and variance is trainable, so you have a mean and variance that you you want to have that you can train that. And of course, I uh, how good or bad for this how how to train this? It's like the same thing as I doing bad pop. Basically, you just have the data there. You you just minimize the loss uh, with respect to this uh, mean and variance. So so you just pop pop back to how do you use sh uh, shift this mean and variance? You will give you a better uh, uh, smaller loss. So um, and uh, this is more detail for Alex lab, but I, I guess I will just skip that. So and uh, yeah, so this is uh Alex lab as I mentioned is a 2012 kind of winner for uh image lab competition, and then like. I, I guess I, I also want to like mention the 2014 like VGG net because I this is like a very common network like people still use now uh, for I don't know for what reason like for example like my student like uh, I, I yeah actually like one of the presenter like he mentioned the post like, I guess if you remember like uh, uh, Mookie's like presentation he said he said like he using uh, was that like Nvidia ha has a uh, uh, I forgot even the model how they call it, but it's like trying to um, recognize the pose of a 3D object, and they the base network that they use VGG net. Uh, I don't know why they use that honestly. Like that's better network now, but they they just use VGG net. But uh, VGG net is like nothing really spectacular compared to uh, Alex that really. Uh, it's just like have more layers if you look at that. And also, like they use uh, smaller filters. You see, like I guess it's hard to for you to see. Like I, I think you can see it. But yeah, if it, this is a like, if not, if this is in class, I guess like, it's very difficult to see. But now, uh, you are seeing the screen should be easy. So like uh, for Alex slide, like, you see like they have like bigger filter, like eleven by eleven. But like in uh, VGG net, basically all the filters is small. This is one one of the characteristics. Uh, a trend that people can't use to like improve uh, CNN is like trying to use smaller filters because like, if you stack like multiple smaller filters they actually you, you can think of like if you have a 3 by 3 filters uh, and if you, you stack it 3 times then the 3 by 3 filters is effective like uh, a 7 by 7 filters right because if you have two 3 by 3 filters stacked to the, together then the support will be like 5 by 5 right if I stack one more three by three, I I have a support of like uh, seven by seven, but if you count number of parameters in that, uh, three three by three filters will be only like uh, three by three is like uh, nine nine by three is like twenty seven twenty seven parameters right, but if you use seven by seven, you will have like forty nine parameters, so typically like the smaller number of parameters is more preferable if you have like, um the same power of representation so uh, uh, typically like, using smaller filters will, will be better so that's why like they switch to like smaller filters uh, and this is the VGG net and uh, this, this as I mentioned they switch to smaller filters uh, there's more um, just counting the memories but I, I won't go through it now like you you, you um, if you understand the basic concept like you can go down to count like uh, after each of the layer, what's the memory usage and so on? Um, and actually, by the way, um, just maybe point out like uh, there's lots of uh, and, and you can also count the number of parameters as well. Apparently, like for fully connected layer, they have lots of parameters, and, and and this is not not really a very desirable feature. And as you can see, like 
uh, in the more recent CNN, they typically will try to avoid to use uh, many uh, fully connected layer. So to just reduce the number of parameters there. Um, and uh, and this is the VGG net. Now next I'd like to mention the Google Lab. Uh, that is say uh, the winner in 2014 like for image net competition. Uh, it has uh, um, so it, it has a kind of like a an in uh, a new idea they propose there is called this inception module. It's just a fancy name that uh, is actually cascading like multiple uh, filters. So more precisely, it's like that. So you have several filters uh, of different size, and you can train all these filters. So then, like you, you just stack them together, like at the output. So you have one by one filter, three by three filters, five by five filters, and then you stack the outputs together. And also, that like, they use this like small filter, um, small filter uh, uh, trick there. So they just don't use this by. So of course I can just do like this. this uh, as uh, okay, as here like I have uh, stacked this. I like, by by the way like uh, know that like uh, for conventional um, uh, convolutional filter, I mean in conventional image processing, one by one filter doesn't make any sense. Right, you're just scaling like the whole image if you have a one by one filter. But remember that like your filter is really volumetric. So therefore one by one makes sense. So when you have a one by one filter, it is actually just you're going to like combine like different layers, like uh you are basically weight sum like different layers. So um and uh here as I mentioned if you have one by one, three by three, five by five, what I what I can do like if, if you just look at if I implement like this, uh then uh let's see. The original image is 28 by 28. Oh, uh, okay. Actually, I, I mentioned straight, but here apparently, like if you have feed by feed filters, if I don't pad, do any padding, my size will become 26 by 26. Way right? here, what it did is like, it do a padding like for both like feed by feed and five by five filters, so that like they they will have the same size as this one by one filters. I mean the output they will have the same size. Uh, as the input as well, like it's the 28 by 28. Um, and um, and if you do just do some counting here, so I have, let's say I have like 128 filters here for, by, for one by one and one time 92 for three by three and 96 by for five by five. I add all of this together. The total dimension is like this. Uh, so you, you have like an expansion here like from 256 to uh, 674 so as I said like we can do this um, uh, one by one filter trick so so this they call this like bottle like a uh, bottle like layer so uh, let's see I yeah this is a better slide here so uh, basically we just change the dimension first like this one the input is like two, 256 so here I shrink it to 64 first using this one by one uh, convolutional layer and then I saw the dimension become like uh, 28 by 28 by 64 then I apply this 3 by 3 then if you count the total number of operations it, it will reduce that is quite significantly uh, I am not going to count this like but you can trust me let's see um, this is like the uh, if I do this like one by one conflict like, uh, for each of this layer here, the total number of operation will be just like two uh, three fifty eight million uh, compared to the original eight uh, fifty four million. So this this is like the Google Lab, like the main new thing for Google Lab. But by the way, this one by one uh, conflict layer was not introduced there like in the Google Lab like. Uh, that uh, it was um, mentioned in other paper. I think it's like a paper called Network in Network. So, but anyway, uh, that's the the main Google that here. They just have lots of these inception layers. So, as you can see, first they have this uh, stem network, just like a comp, uh, regular comp uh, network layer. So, just comp polling and 
and then after that, like we have this uh several like inception layer, and then like you have output, and you can see like you have this kind of like tiny tail here. So basically, they pull out some output in the uh, intermediate layer just to help training. Uh, so basically, besides this, have a classification output. Uh, it also look at the classification output in the intermediate layer. So basically, also train the layer here to pull some output in the middle. So uh, the idea is like if you you have the lateral too deep, you want to back pop like the gradient all the way back to the earlier layer is quite difficult. Therefore, you have this intermediate layer uh, trying to train to help out. So basically, you can also compute loss here. So you have loss here. This can be L1, L2, L3, and the total loss will be combined together. And this L1 will also contribute gradient like from here. Like so, you can get closer to the earlier layer. So therefore, it's, it gives you better gradient information to earlier layer for it to train. So any question here? So this is a Google Lab. I have a question. I think. Yes. So when we when we do the one v one or the the one by one convolution. Yes. Is that just essentially a like a down sampling or? It is like like precisely like this. So for example, like you have one layer here, have a sixty four by fifty six by fifty six. Now I have a one by one, uh, conf, uh, conf layer will be just like I have for each of the pixel. I take a Take take a a tube here like this way, a kind of one dimensional structure. Uh, then I will just like filter that, and I have sixty four for example. Like I will be just weigh the sum this this factor here and become this. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. For yeah, and weigh the sum one, I will have one element here. Weigh the sum another one, I have another element, and I will do it like thirty two times basically. Got it. Yes. So I, for some reason I have. I'm not sure I was so anyway uh, let's see I try to turn off the it seems like my radio is on let me turn it off okay yeah so let's see this is Google Lad and uh, and then like, another very famous one is a like, Westlet. I guess like, this is probably like uh, most people will use. Uh, even though it's like, a little bit dated now, it's like, probably still like very uh, much uh, the state of the art. Uh, so Westlet. So the original idea is like that. So basically, they went to a bottleneck. Now it's like they try to. They, they apparently they see that like whenever you increase the number of layers. You get improve uh in performance, but up to the point say like, for say Google Lab you have like twenty two layers, and then Microsoft they try to like beat that and then like, increase the number of layers. So what they observe is that like um they have um they can even overfit the model basically. They they have this is like the training error with twenty layers, and when they increase to fifty six layer, uh, even the training error not not to mention the testing error. Even the training error, like they they cannot, um, they they cannot like improve. Like supposing if you are doing the right thing, you increase the model size, you should be able to overfit. Or eventually, you should be able to say have like very very small like training error, uh, as long as your model is compact, uh, compact enough. Uh, so, <coughs> so to 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 kind of like address this problem. The idea is thinking, okay, since I have so many layers already, maybe in the later layer that like uh, I'm already doing so well, then instead of trying to train the lateral, let's say like from X to generate a HX or something new, so maybe like my 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 uh my output like input here is pretty close to the output already, then maybe I'll try to train the lateral to uh to create to to create a difference in that 
So let's say you can imagine that like I have this X here is very close to what I want already. So I'm training the network to create a difference. So therefore like what I have is I will be passing this X here. Also at the output, I'm just training the network so that like this is going to generate the difference of this output and input that basically this fx here this fx supposedly uh will be small maybe like if my original x is already pretty close to what i want so that that's the idea so but um and it works well and it works pretty well so they they have this call like this uh skip uh, connection basically call it and they have all this like skip connection like that and they they give input performance um uh, but actually eventually people realize that like uh most likely let's see question yes so what's what's the uh, residual block uh oh uh, the residual, uh, residual block is just like this so residual block is just like like the original comp layer but you add a uh, skip connection like this okay yeah just just like that it's nothing really special so they they make a fancy name, I know, like like the inception layer and something like it, it, it's totally misleading. I would say sometimes. So um, and um, <clears throat> and that, that basically that's it. So I I think they have more detail, but I don't think this detail is like very meaningful. So um, this is the original structure. How they do it? I like say they it decrease the number of fully connected layer. Uh. And uh, yeah, they just use one fully connected layer. So as I mentioned, because fully connected layer is kind of expensive in terms of like number of uh, number of parameters in the network and also the computation as well, the amount of computation involved. And and uh, and they, they in the mod uh, in the experiment at that time, like they have different depths. Of course, like the deeper, the better. Uh, they went uh, as deep as you want to, like 152 layers. Um, and uh, they also use uh, some of these tricks we mentioned earlier. They have, they can improve <coughs> the performance using this one by one filter. So to just shrink the size, let's say the input is 256 to begin with, you shrink the size to 64 first. I mean the depth to 64 and then I use a part of filter like 3 by 3 and then kind of expand this back to 256. Um, so and uh, oh, I, I don't have more slides for I just cut cut this short. So but I mean like one, one thing like uh, maybe I, I I should mention that like eventually I guess like people uh, most of the researcher now i guess they believe that like they have better f performance it's not really because their original motivation saying okay I, I want to have like this uh input it's like the output so like i want to kind of like train the difference instead of like uh training um uh the uh to s speed out the output directly so people now believe that like they was like it's give you better performance it's, solely because of this skip connection you can think of like this is like super highway to pass through back the gradient so because like, if without this skip connection like your gradient can only pass through like from this main uh, main path here like at the middle so but with this skip connection you can really have gradient pass like much quicker to earlier layer and as i mentioned like, if you your you basically your gradient information will decay as you pass back so with this skip connection just will allow you to like uh, uh, train a deeper lateral so therefore like better performance so therefore nowadays even people don't exactly use a westnet it's very common to introduce this skip connection just to improve performance um and uh so this is a a little bit data work i i didn't check like whether there's like other work similar to that maybe uh, you can Take it up if you're interested. But this is a very good summary, like back uh, in 2017. So just a comparison of like different uh, lateral models, like CNN models. So you have VGG net here, like it's actually pretty big. Like this, I think this um, the size of the circle is the uh, memory usage, and uh, this 
the vertical axis is the accuracy and horizontal axis is like the computational capacity. So VGG is not really that accurate but use like lots of memory computation as well. Uh, you see like for example inception is like the Google networks, like different version of inception. Actually as as it goes, like uh, inception and Westlet they have different version, like they, they get more and more similar to each other. Like inception networks, say like in the later version like Google Network, they also borrow lots of ideas from Westlet. So uh and um but yeah, this this is a very good slice anyway to if um and uh so what next? So one thing I like to mention is a uh, data augmentation. So this is a, a a trick that is very handy, and people use a lot. Like uh, it's a standard trick in turn uh, in training, probably not just say for uh, computation application for as for other application as well, because like data is expensive, especially uh, label data is very expensive. Like. Of course, uh, if you think of images, uh, images is very easy to get, but if you need to get label data, it's expensive. So one trick, for example, like a simple um, uh, classification problem, let's say I just want to recognize cat. So one, one thing I can do is like, I, I only have one image here, but I, I can do lots of transform to this image to generate more data, right? Because maybe I, I just change the color a little bit, like uh, maybe this one, I guess I, I, I changed from uh, color image to black and white. This is still a cat to a human. Uh, or like if I want to do like a mirror image, it's still a cat, right? And, and or like I can do like random cropping, scaling, uh, it's still a cat. Uh, as long as I, I guess you want to focus the cropping like around here, they like make more sense. I guess if you keep cropping this one, probably not too good. But um, you can do lots of this one, random crop, uh, cropping, scaling, or like rotation or uh, you can do color g doing and uh, uh, basically everything you can think of as long as say for example a rec recognition problem if uh, after all this stretching and uh, shearing and uh, for you to look at that you think it's still a cat then uh, then it's okay I'm not sure if you use the uh, fast AI libraries in the homework they they it's a kind of a standard like um, you you can um, in the interface, uh, you can specify what kind of transform is allowed. When you pull the batch, they will automatically apply all this like uh, data augmentation trick. So, um, so that that is actually pretty standard. So, of course, uh, if you want to do it like by yourself, then uh, you 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 better, yeah, you you should um, uh, kind of like. Uh, you, I mean, like if you're doing from scratch, then def definitely you you should aware that like you want to have like data augmentation. Uh, so another thing, let's see, I like to mention. Oh yes, a uh, very important is transfer learning. So uh, the idea of transfer learning is like if you train the lecture from scratch, always it will be very expensive to train. Basically, you need GPUs and you need GPUs to train for weeks. I mean, it doesn't make too much sense. But luckily, like there are already lots of train model uh, online, like available, uh, like uh, for everyone. So, for so for example, like you have P train model for Westlat, for like uh, for like AlexLat and so on. Like just train on like for some image lat data. So for example, this is a uh, AlexLat like. For example, and uh, like uh, this is P-train model. For example, you have a different problem. Uh, uh, you are you are not going to recognize uh, classes objects like in the image lat data. So image lat have like a, a thousand classes, and you are not interested in those thousand classes. But maybe you are applying to a kind of like um, uh, autonomous driving. You are only care about sign and wall sign and also pedestrian so you can just like create a smaller data set only with those objects and those labels so what you're going to do like I, I can change the um, change the uh, model a little bit for example like this uh, you see the last layer the fully connected layer with thousand uh, and then softmax because you have a thousand classes, right? So what we can do is say like, if I only have like twenty classes, I can like change, swap out this like layer, 
and my uh, swap in a layer is like uh, fully connected like with 20 classes and then like what I, I can just train the model say I'll freeze all this earlier layer I'm not going to I, it's very easy to freeze it like because I I'm basically here I'm just bad propagation bad propagating gradient what I can do is I either I just keep updating the um updating the parameters here or I, I can simply like I can stop propagating gradient up to a certain point so then like then I will all only update weights here so then I can only train like this this here so this is not not just that you can train much, much faster but also like uh, when you have like only not a lot of data uh, then uh, it you cannot basically you cannot uh, afford to train the entire model you just don't have enough data to train the entire model so um so that that's basically like uh of course if you have more data you can try to train earlier layers like for example if you have mm, a medium-sized data set then you can train not just this layer but maybe like a little bit more layer so any questions for here so um uh, and uh let's see yeah, this this is just one paper like back in like two thousand uh, twenty fourteen, and just illustrate that they they use this Alex Lad and I think it's they use uh, Alex Lad and they just uh show that like, I can use Alex Lad and I can tackle a like, lot of different problems basically just modify the lateral a little bit and then uh, uh tackle like different problems here. So uh, this is just a summary if you have very little data then you you can just like at the last layer for example let's just swap this uh, even like not fully connected layer use a linear classifier say um or if it's a regression problem uh, or like uh, if if you have a lot of data you can find two more day more layers uh so if your data set like of course if your data set is very different from the original data set then then you are kind of uh, out of luck. For example, like if you're you are tackling like image light classification, oh, sorry, no, no, I, I mean you have a problem with working on like uh, medical data. Let's say like it's all, uh, for example, like for COVID nineteen, like you have like all the CT scan here. Mm, using image light data, p train model may not be too good, like because your characteristics of the images is quite different. Maybe the early layers are good, but the, you probably need to pre-train more more layers. Also, not pre-train like you need to train more layers like for your model. <coughs> so ah uh, okay, it's pretty fast. So and uh, so I was just looking to like several like quick mention several quick applications beyond like classification. So um, uh, as I mentioned, like, I will talk about like uh uh. Um. Uh, what? Uh, camera models. Uh, next week. So I actually I I, I see I am skipping lots of materials I used to talk about like in the past. But I I think it's okay. Uh, with like neural networks, many of these applicate. Um, uh, I mean this at least a little bit uh outdated. So although sometimes I think that outdated at least is still uh valuable because uh, if you want to improve, uh, at least you you better know lots of different techniques. Oftentimes it's like um, you're actually combining different techniques. Some of them maybe you be the outdated, but maybe you combine with like some newer techniques, you get something that's better. But I, I think like this time I don't have time to talk about those. But uh, so, but instead like I, I will, for example, I, I won't go into cementation, classing technique for cementation, but here I, I, I will just explain how you can do cementation, say using like CNN. So, for CNN, let's say we have this so-called semantic segmentation problem as a very simple problem that you, you just have an image, you want to look at each pixel and say like whether the pixel belong to each of the possible objects. Let's say here, <coughs> the object of interest, maybe I have cat, uh, grass, uh, tree, sky, for example, then I, I want to identify this pixel as say beyond belong to a cat and so on. And um, and for this like semantic segmentation, like what, what we can think of like we can think of this is actually a classification problem like for patches, right? So one very simple idea can be like I, I can take a patch of a, a, an image and then I just try to classify each of the patch to see whether it's a belong to a cat or tree and so on. 
So um, so then like we can, we can actually use CNN for that. So we have the entire image. Then we are going to classify. We have like multiple conf layer. Let's say I have convolution, and then like maybe valid, and then here I, I'm not going to do down sampling, right? Because I my output size prediction size will be the same as the input size. So therefore like one one way, okay, the live way will be I, I will do conf layer without uh, without polling, without down sampling and then go all the way and then like uh, eventually I have this um um last layer will be like a f kind of like a f f uh conf layer with uh okay with the depth will be number of classes. So therefore like for each pixel I will have like this is essentially scores for this pixel uh, for different classes. So I will just like pick the one with the highest score. So as as the uh, as as the as the um the the classification output. So um a any question here? Like it's it's pretty simple, straightforward. But it's kind of amazing that like you can use CNN to do something like that. But actually this live approach um is not very good because I the problem is like this is a, a bit too many parameters, it's a bit too expensive. So we, we we still want to do down sampling but like after we need we need to get back to the original dimension. So therefore we need to uh this is like this down sample path is like as we see like we can do this uh either doing polling or like we can do like conflict with try more than one. So and then for up sampling this we, we didn't see it before, but up sampling what we can do is like uh an inverse of this uh down sampling step. So for example like if I have like um kind of like polling like uh mass polling in the earlier layer I can do a up sampling you using like different kind of uh 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 different possibilities for example like I can use uh up sampling just as a Lewis label that basically say like I just up sampling like 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 a patch just like this or I can have this so-called bed of nails, so I will upsample and just like uh, upsample some of this uh, pixel there, or or like um, I guess more reasonable one will be like this so-called mass unpolling. Uh, that will be like if I at the at the like uh, original like mass polling layer, if the maximum is like at this location here, when I get him back. Like this, do this unpolling. I'll only uh put a long zero value like at the same location there. So, does does it make sense? So uh, this is actually I think is this is typical what people actually do. So uh, and uh, in terms of like um. Uh, convolution, you can just do the transpose of that because I uh, you you think think of like convolution, it's actually just a linear layer, right? So if you have uh for example like if you you think of like something like that like a x equal to y uh, and a is like uh if i want to get back x here so at least like, if you want to see the dimension like okay this let's say x is like 10 by 1 this is like 5 by 1 so this a is like 5 by 10 let's say so if i want to have oh, i have y here i want to get back kind of like an x here uh with what I can do is uh is I can multiply by the transpose of a so you see that dimension will fit well so this uh y is five by one uh a transpose now is like ten by five and this will be like ten by one for x <coughs> and with this transpose operation like in CNN it makes quite a lot of sense also like so if you think of like uh the original let's see yeah. So original <coughs> so what when 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 I have a transpose like that would be something like this. So I, I have this original filter of this CNN filter. So uh maybe the filter is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So if I do this is the original input, if I do a CNN would be a dot product of this patch with the uh with the patch of this input at this location, right? So now if I wanted to do the inverse, what I'm going to do is say, let's say this is the uh, after the original uh, kind of CNN uh, layer, 
uh, so therefore now the, now the input output I kind of swap swap uh, Oops, uh, I, I can't really hear you actually. Yes. Oh, okay. Is that a question or like, okay. Uh, maybe not. So, okay, maybe let, let me continue first. So, um, so I have 20 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, so for this one, like, okay, I, I have this one. If I, I do the transfer, it's actually this one multiplied by this filter now. And then like, uh, I have this value like five, six, eight, uh, is it five, six, eight, nine here. And then I move to the next one will be this one multiplied by this filter, uh, this guy. If I assume this is one here, that, that would be like five, six, eight, nine here. So if I have two here, I will be like this guy here multiplied by this guy here, I will have, have a 10, 12, uh, 14, 16, 18. So at this location here will be just some this six, some uh, six uh, at eight, and this is nine, eight, 14, like this. Uh, so this will be like how we do this uh, transfer. Okay, this is a 1D example, let's just re we doing that. So, but basically like, um, we know how to down sample and up sample, therefore we can do do this. And that's exactly like how people usually do for like this cementa uh, cementation. So uh, when you, uh, so therefore like the only thing you need is really, you will need this uh, 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 label data. So maybe it's a little bit difficult to get, like one possibility would be just do simulation. Uh, I mean, like for example, like you can generate data using for example, like a uh, game engine, a, a real game engine to create some label like, or like you can ask, use, have like people like to manually label like this, each of these pixel. Of course, this will be like extremely painful. So, but if you have the label data, then you, you can just like train as usual, like with this lateral like that and just try to find all this weight here. Oh no, this is not weight here. This is just a dimension, but try to have the last function is just say I want to make sure that like, this label is correct and then uh, I will back pop back uh, and uh, and kind of like optimize the ways. So this is like uh, semantic segmentation. So um, now let's talk a little bit about like detection that will be a combination of like classification and localization. So in a classification problem, like we just have a a scene here, a picture here, we just expect one object. So, and we don't care where is the object. So here we want to localize the object as well. So if we only have one one in object of interest, so what we can do is say, we can just uh, combine a classification. So we can have a classification here. So say I have a original like Alex Lat uh, model here. So for the last layer, like I always really have that where it's this like for the the layer just before uh, the last layer, that uh, uh, is like the basically the last layer. The original like uh, uh, Alex Lad is basically a fully connected layer from four uh, four thousand to nine uh, ten thousand classes here. So I can also impose another layer like attach, basically I have multiple head now. This also like attached to the second last layer that has like, uh, basically for have a dimension of like 4,000. And then this one will basically the output like four values here, just like indicate the location of that object, basically at the bounding box, like the, the location X, Y, and also width and height. Then like we, we will have like two courses here. So we will just combine this two uh, loss functions together, two losses together, and then just try to optimize that. And uh, so I guess it's a very simple idea. So you, you can do the same thing for like, say post estimation as well, right? Because if I have tried to recognize someone's post, like I have like, say I have 14 joints here. So I just need to identify the location of all these joints. And then I try to um, combine all these 
as one loss function and try to minimize that as well. Um, so uh, this is like for only one object here. So, but if I have multiple objects, uh, wait a sec. If I have multiple objects, the problem is that I, I cannot do the same thing anymore because I don't know how many objects are here. So I, I cannot uh, ahead of time determine, like for example, like if I have like uh, four objects, then I will I should need 16 numbers here for the bounding box. If I have like many, many objects, I have many, many numbers. So I, I cannot make it as a regression problem. So <coughs> the simplest solution probably is I use a sliding windows. So it's just slide windows and try to see if there's an object here or not. But that will be very expensive because we need to try out all the combinations, right? We need to try out uh, slide the windows over the entire image. At the same time, we need to try different resolution. I mean, try different scale because some object may be smaller, some object may be bigger. Um, so <clears throat> a, a better idea that is back in a uh 20 i forgot this work now that was but that's fine i'll see and then yeah 2014 so they use something combined with some classic uh image processing that actually back in the days there were already some work that trying to identify like uh interesting objects potential objects and they basically combine this work um with cnn so they use the works like for example like this um earlier works that will be identified this kind of like vision proposals. So this is like the potential objects of interest and for each of these objects of interest they will pass through the CNN models there. And uh the problem is like it will be very time consuming because I like, also like apparently is wasting lots of computations because you uh here like you are cu cutting the image uh multiple pieces for example here i have interest of one ob object of interest here potential like region proposal here but i also have this is another interest of kind of uh region proposal so maybe i have lots of overlapping like maybe this another one another one and each of them i will pass through the comp layer again and again and again apparently it's not very kind of useful no, not useful, not, not, not very um, computationally efficient. So therefore, like, actually immediately, the next year, the same group, uh, they proposed this fast LCNN, the original way they call it LCNN. Uh, it's like region, region proposal, like CNN, basically. The fast LCNN is like they, they just do one CNN at one time for the entire image, but from the region proposal, uh, they can't can't figure out like in <coughs> in the up in the intermediate CNN layer like where is actually the proposal and they 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 would just say uh, take out that part uh, for classification so and um, and this allow them to do faster and uh, actually do quite a bit faster and uh, let's see that's that's the test time here that's the original test time for. Uh, LCNN is like they take like uh, 47 sec. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, 49 second. <coughs> That's including the region proposal computation. And then like for fast LCNN, they have significant speed of actually only 2.3 second. But actually all of this 2.3 second, more than two second, almost two second is like computing the region proposal. Uh, I mean using this classic uh, uh, computer vision uh, algorithms. So then, like it began to make sense that like we try to do something to reduce the computational time for the region proposal. Uh, actually, one thing, and then actually immediately the next year they have this faster LCNN work in the same by the same group. The idea is like you instead of like using this classic approach, it's actually much faster to train a lateral to estimate the region proposal. They, therefore, like they they actually train a region proposal network exactly doing the things that this classic approach is doing like to compute the region proposal and actually i want to emphasize that this kind of trick has been used like many times it's like if you have like some com expensive computations i think also like uh, for example like in mri stuff like that you have some expensive computations 
you you can always train a model, a uh, CNN model to do the computation instead. So typically, like training the model is very expensive, but you only care about the test time, right? When you're testing it, it's like multiple, like just multiple like layers of like linear operations, and then like with uh, valid and so on, and it's very very fast. So therefore, like. Uh, this is actually a very common trick like people use also like use new lateralists to reduce computational uh, capacity for some like old algorithms so um and uh, this is uh, the faster LCN now they can kind of shrink the time test time to only like 0.2 seconds uh, instead like the original version is 49 seconds and uh, and I, I also want to mention like uh, that's work like I think it's also by the same group like in uh, later years like, or like more recently they have this like feature peering networks it's like they because the original RCNN they they um they do not really exp explicitly consider like multi scale features so here like they just have a kind of PMI structure like more like more like to some classic idea here so and they have a Westlet that uh, uh, have done sample every once in a while and then like you pull out the intermediate layers and use that for um, um, oh actually this, this is not very important like in the later layer they put it out and also combine with the early layers the idea is that you want to have like this uh, um, lower resolution features like be combined with the high resolution features, uh, the stuff like that, and then like in each of these level, they will uh, kind of extract that and have a head for that for recognition, and that uh, is kind of like the state of the art now. Uh, so that's of course I have some uh, other newer tricks and so on, but I guess I will just more or less stop here for like detection. Uh, Okay, but uh, okay. Let, let me stop that. Like after this, like final one, it's like another like different approach. I like, call uh, YOLO, and there's another like uh, um, another similar uh, work like called SSD. Both of them like uh, is trying to do recognition with that proposal. Basically, the idea is like the signing window, but they they do not slide it like pixel by pixel. They do it like just kind of partition the image into grid. So uh, I'm then like trying to see if there's an object there, and uh, because there's no proposal, actually it can run even faster, and also like because like you you can have, for example like uh, object have different shape and size way right? sizes way. Right? So what they do is like they will for each of the grid there they will try a combination of different sh shape of boxes. So and then for all these boxes, they just try to see like if there's an object there. Uh, that's uh, YOLO. Actually, like you, you can find source code like for example for YOLO and it won pretty quickly. So um um actually uh, several of past students I uh, use that like for their project like, for using YOLO. Um and uh, and. Uh, Okay, that I uh, control time reasonably well. I guess I can slow down a little bit now. So, <clears throat> um, I guess last thing like I like to mention is like another segmentation. Like the earlier one, I I, I mentioned this kind of like uh, uh, semantic segmentation. But for semantic segmentation, let's say if I have two cats here, it it would just say for each pixel, so like it say okay, this is a cat. Okay, it doesn't have okay. This cats have many legs here. But anyway, so um. So the um they uh I mean it would just say like okay this is a pixel of a cat, but it doesn't say like whether it's a pixel of this cat or this cat. I I, I don't I'm I, there's no way for me to know like whether I have like one cat here, two cats here, and so on. So uh that's another problem is a little bit more uh kind of like uh higher requirement than the original semantic segmentation is I like, call this instant segmentation. Not only I want to know like whether each of the pixels is like belong to what object, I I want to know <coughs> whether like pixel for this object is a separate object or not. So for example, here I have a pixel here is actually for a dog, and I I want to know this pixel is like belong to this dog, but not belongs to this dog. Yeah, is that uh, clear? So um, 
one way to tackle that like is actually just using the uh, what we have so far say like we have this mass LCNN or YOLO or any of this and, and actually in particular mass LCNN they they already know the bounding box and the object there right? so basically uh, and the, some intermediate layer you know that okay this here uh, I I have classified that okay this is a uh, here is a, a, a dog here so I have a classification score uh, wait yes yes I I, I, I <coughs> and also like I, I basically I have for each of the potential objects there I, I have the I, I know the from the original mass LCNN I have the class for that uh, object there and also like I have the location there so I have the bounding box for that so I, I can use the layers to just uh, so I know the bounding box here now I can use the uh, corresponding like coefficients at that layer uh, at that bound in that bounding box and to just uh, add additional layer uh, CNN layers and do prediction just create a mask just like like uh, the uh, semantic segmentation at the beginning basically you can think of this is like I will attach a semantic semantic segmentation network just for this particular kind of bounding box here and then we will try to predict the mask there for that object uh, and uh, and from that mask you, you can extract another score right? then you can train uh, also along this path basically you can um, yeah of course you can train the entire model or you can first just train the mass LCN for this one and then you you can just train the uh, additional uh, layers here uh, and then like with that like we have this so-called mass LCN and uh, it's not the state of the art you, I, I think the same group they have like some more recent results that's even more impressive but uh, even like this is like okay like two three years ago like uh, it's really good actually compared to classic like uh little um i mean uh comparison like algorithm is is really really good so and um and you can even count the number of people you can see right this is like, a person at the back like you can very accurately recognize that and uh you can you can use the same thing to kind of uh, identify posts posts poses so just do the same thing uh, but you will do uh uh, not uh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to know, as far as this mask RCNN thing goes, uh, how well does it do with tracking and real time processing? Uh, it is reasonably slow, honestly. <laughs> uh, it's not it's not very slow, but it's it's about the same speed as like uh, faster faster RCNN basically like because it's just attached this as additional layer that layer doesn't cost like too much in terms of computational power but that one I think with a GPU you're uh, talking about like the, of course it's a little bit dated but nowadays I think it's like, still like maybe 10 frames per second so um it's uh, for very good computer so um maybe four or five frames per second if you do exactly use it for tracking I think it's doable I mean the thing is doable especially like you see like Tesla can do it because if you implement everything in FPGA it will be doable but if uh, if you just uh, uh, doing uh, a consulting work that is not going to design FPGA or maybe I got a um, reasonably powerful GPU desktop or like a server for that uh, uh, and uh, you probably need to apply like some more check for that otherwise um, the checking rate is reasonably slow uh, so if you you have the objects moving very quickly then maybe but of course like, some application is like, not um, real time right? for example like if you have surveillance camera you're trying to track the motion of everyone but you only need that like when you okay when you have a crime scene there you need to go back and look at that that uh, video and you you can afford to process it for 10 hours then it's okay well can it track through occlusion yeah yeah yeah. you see like it track through pretty well eh? this one you see like you have like uh, 
a student here at the back, you can only see like part of that. Of course, I. Okay, uh, if you have the video, okay, you're checking the entire video. If you, you have that object completely occluded, then of course I, you need to have some other algorithms, to, because I, it's just not in the scene, right? You to kind of like, for example, you need to get back to this older tally for some common filters and so on. Like just combine them together, you have some missing object maybe, do some basic things, yeah. But if you it's only partially or cool like this, you 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 will be able to identify that. Most of the time, I guess I, there's someone missing. Also, I guess this guy got missing. But yeah. Did did I answer your question? Uh, I mean, sure. I was just curious. Yeah. So, oh, okay, actually, this is the last line. This is good. So, oh, okay, I'm exactly on time. Um, so, you guys have any other questions? Like, let's see. Do I have... I have one, someone say chat here. Uh, okay, I guess uh, that... <coughs> so, uh, if no more questions, then I... Um, I have a question. Oh, yes, yes. It's not really relevant, I think. Sure. So maybe I'll just wait until... No, no, no that's fine, actually. Okay. Um, so talking about data augmentation... Yes. Uh, ...a while ago. Yes. And I'm just wondering... Um, so I'm working on a, a separate project. Yes. And, and I'm doing a little bit of data augmentation. <laughs> and one of the augmentations I'm doing is I'm rotating um, the image. Yes. And... In, in the mask or that in the label image that I'm I'm rotating along mm. with the training image. Yes. I've got some very long thin objects, and these long thin objects, when under the rotation, they're they're getting kind of um, like split or they they're losing pixels just because of the interpolation. I think. Oh and yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, <laughs> uh, is there maybe a better interpolation I should be using or? Do you understand? Yes, I understand your question. Actually, I I would assume okay you. Uh, your object is really thin. Yeah, like a, it's like veins, um, in a retina. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Uh. So if you uh. So uh, I I'm just curious. Like, what what's your uh, your your problem there? Is like, trying to recognize, or you're trying to segmentation, or like what? Yeah, it's a segmentation. Uh, yeah. Problem. So. Uh, <clears throat> you, what 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 uh what do you use for rotation there? I'm using it's just a I'm making a MATLAB uh, script to do the rotation. Oh okay okay I guess I and uh, I think. I think the interpolation it uses by default is like uh, nearest neighbor. Oh yeah, yeah. I guess you okay. That that would be some classic thing. Like I think you can just, if you remember, like uh, er, er, early lectures, say, like, um, um, do, when you do interpolation, you can use like for example cubic spine or like use uh, um, by 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 uh, what's that called? Something like that. Uh, There's like uh, bilateral. I think. Yeah. 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 So would you just uh, maybe like recommend that I just test different ones and see which, if any of them work better? I actually I'm thinking like um <coughs> um you you using MATLAB. <laughs> yeah. So um where is that actually like your your uh, what, what you're using PyTorch or TensorFlow or like how so how I'm using you? um MATLAB to do the augmentation. And yes. I'm using um. TensorFlow and Keras to do the implementation, and I know Keras has some data augmentation tools. Yeah. But um, I was finding that I didn't have as much control over. It uh, doesn't have like a rotation there, like. It does, mm -hmm. um, but it, I was getting the same issue with the. Uh, yeah. So. I, I guess it's an interpolation issue. Yeah, I, 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 I. That, um, actually. I, I, it's, uh, 
it's hard to say like if I I guess I need to look at the image because I maybe I can send you an email uh, yeah yeah something yes so uh, uh, uh other do any others have any other questions or like comments so if not I, I will see you guys like, uh next week and as I said we'll talk about cam models and then like um and uh yeah go back to something oh. like not do oh. to, yes but it's about the project um when is the um when we have to have our report sent to you i just want to know what what's that again portrait um i'm saying like when are the project reports due oh i uh i i didn't put on canvas yet i i forgot okay, okay. maybe i, I didn't let's see right yeah i it should be due like uh the First day, I think, like something like uh, in the final week. Okay, so first the week of finals. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 um, yeah, I think like always, you know, like it's a like, first day the final week. So just, okay. yeah, just make sure don't don't be late because I, yeah. So okay. for that one, yeah. So okay. So uh. Are we are like doing dead week or uh, final week. Yes, and we are not doing anything for the dead week. So uh, next week we'll do the final week uh for 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 classes, so after that like uh, we won't have any regular classes, so if you oh, want the project is due in the final week, week. yeah in the final week okay. yeah basically uh yeah yes oh and also um do you do you want us to have a PowerPoint if we're not presenting still um. No, it's not necessary if you're not, not presenting, but if you want to have extra credit, you can just, as I said, like, oh. just take a video. It doesn't necessarily to be a PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. It, it can be like screencast like that. I, actually, you can just open the Zoom, for example. Eh? Open the Zoom and then you, you can just record your presentation. And okay. yeah, right, if you, you want, yes. Okay, so okay so then i i guess if no more questions i will just stop this um uh, meeting now okay